You're about to find some important answers. How did we end up being both the most privileged society on Earth while also having a victim mentality rife in the younger generations? The connected thread lines in the modern education system, and I don't think anyone has been able to expose that in the way Jordan Peterson just did. There's a gap in what our children are taught around how we built these flourishing societies. And that's where a sense of ingratitude is coming from while threatening to tear it all down instead. There's a lot I want to build on after you watch this next clip. Our children are so badly educated by people who have no idea. People don't know how bad it was. They don't know how far we've come. They're never taught that. They're not taught how terrible things had become in many places in the 20th century. Like my students in my personality class, these were smart kids at the University of Toronto. They were well-educated by, by comparative standards. None of them knew anything about what happened in Stalinist Soviet Union or in Maoist China or in Cambodia. No one had ever ta taught them. And so, so I, th I think, you know, young people, they, they see inequality in the world. And they see some of the painful consequences of inequality because there are painful consequences. And then they're enticed into finding a quick source of blame that requires no thought and also enticed into manifesting a moral virtue that is neither moral nor virtuous. And so, and then, and so here we are. And instead of, uh, you know, I've thought for many years, decades, that whenever I walk out on the street and things aren't on fire, I'm pretty damn thrilled at how stable and peaceful things are. I don't take electricity for granted. I don't take the integrity of the supply chain for granted. I truly think these are miracles. I don't think the fact that the default interaction between human beings in, in, this, in the Western world, broadly speaking, the default economic transaction is based on trust. I don't take that for granted. That's a bloody miracle. It took us hardly any societies have ever managed that. And it took us thousands and tens of thousands of years to produce that. But I think children, our children are so badly educated by people who have no idea. They have no idea about economics. They have no idea about history. They have no idea about privation or suffering. They're looking for easy answers and, and, uh, and, and people to blame for the remaining, you know, catastrophes of the world. You know why I think that is? Our education system never even set out to educate in the truest sense of the word, but to train and mass produce an army of obedient workers that the market needs. We'd be hoping for too much if we thought this system was ever meant for anything more than that in the first place, since the current Prussian model of our education came about as a response to the needs of labor after the Industrial Revolution. I actually looked up what the US Department of Education's mission statement is, and one sentence from it makes things very clear, and it says, I quote, the education department's mission is to promote student achievement and preparation for global competitiveness by fostering educational excellence and ensuring equal access. Its aim isn't to mold a new generation of Americans into appreciation for the massive privilege it is to exist in a world that at least functions and the historical perspective and sacrifices needed to make that a reality. And you already know the result of that. An education system that's not concerned with much more than training useful labor for the market leaves open a massive gap in exactly that space. It forces inside of the system to capitalize on this vacuum by giving students a meaning and perspective of their own. That's exactly what has happened as a certain kind of resent far left strand of the political culture has taken over the education system and it's pushing out in droves the kind of young and naive activists that can't stop screaming that they're oppressed. It's subsumed by an ideology that's dividing people up on the basis of their characteristics like race, gender, and religion, and telling them all the ways they're oppressed in order to rile them up against each other and the system. I actually remember there was an incredible study with America's college students that asked them whether they believed they were privileged or oppressed. The paper titled, Are You Privileged or Oppressed? Students' conceptions of themselves and others revealed something pretty disappointing. A majority of white students reported seeing themselves as privileged, while most ethnic minorities consistently reported being oppressed or a combination of both. What's interesting is that the definition for that oppression was actually things like being a first-generation American or being born to migrant laborer parents. But is that oppression or just hardship? As Vivek Ramaswamy once said, hardship's not a choice, but being a victim is a choice. 
And it's a sad reflection that America's college and university students would be so quick to construe one as the other. What was also interesting is that the results showed a difference on the basis of race rather than something like economic class, which also casts a very dim light on how modern education is drilling a racially charged political narrative into the students' minds from a young age. Here's the question I love to ask my students is, what would I have to pay you for you to never use your, your, your iPhone and the internet again for the remainder of your life? And... Mm. I've never get I've never been able to get a student to to do it for less than five million dollars. It's like mm -hmm. you have this five million dollar thing that you own. <laughs> you're all you're all five millionaires because you get to walk around with these devices. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. You are you are so prosperous, so rich compared to to anybody that's come before you. How could you not be anything other than than just just hyper? grateful for the life that we have. Well, you know, I, th I think that one of the things we need to do about this is we need to start training young people to think about themselves as possessed of more possibility than they know what to do with and then encouraged to harness that in, in, in so and say, well, look, you, you have all the food that you could have and you have all the information that there is. You've got it all in front of you. Now that you have it all in front of you, what's the most noble vision you can bring forth to make use of that possibility? You know, and, and I know some of the research I've done on helping people make a vision for the future, future authoring program, we show them pretty clearly that you can motivate students. We drop the dropout rate of boys in, in community college 50% by just having them sit down for 90 minutes and develop a vision. So you say, look, you look at what's in front of you way more than anyone's ever had in history. And some people might have a little more in front of them than you, like certainly, but when you have more than you can ever use, how much do you need? And, and, and then who should you be to live up to that? Well, that's, you know, our collective problem at the moment, trying to solve that and hopefully solving it before we let bitterness and resentment and historical ignorance get the upper hand. Because it's kind of a battle at the moment. I think what our students truly lack in an appreciation of the massive gift they've been given for free, taken for granted because they were never told the sacrifices that went into it. Perhaps showing them the huge burden they have on their shoulders to do justice is the first step toward a shift in their mindset. Students can't be expected to cherish something they don't know where it came from and never had to work for. Take, for example, one simple fact that has almost been impossible in all of human history, and that's the extremely long supply chain that we have built that stretch across the planet. The thing about a supply chain is that it's a system of human cooperation that benefits everyone in the chain, despite not personally not knowing any other person for it. For example, here's something incredible to be grateful for. When you go buy bread from the store, there's a chain with potentially hundreds of people cooperating to bring that product to you. It includes the farmer that grows the wheat, the truck driver that transports it in between places, the worker that cleans and separates it, and the person that bakes and packages it for the end consumer. You don't know any of those people, and yet we've built an ingenious system where there's millions of people working all the time to produce the things you want and need. Economist Leonard Reed made a similar point like this about a simple pencil in an essay in the 50s titled I pencil, the long essay showed that there are thousands of people's labor that goes into making a single pencil, which is offered to you to buy for a tiny fraction of the cost of that labor. Doesn't that deserve the greatest gratitude we have to offer? These human cooperation systems that make everyone of us richer would have been impossible without a reliable legal system, a society based on trust and hard work, as well as a country that was built on the view that human competition can become a form of cooperation. With our computer technology, every single child, I would say on the planet, but certainly in the, in the states where everyone has access to computational equipment, Every single child should be an expert speed reader because computers could train children to automate letter, phoneme, and word recognition perfectly rapidly because computers are great at mass practice. And if the faculties of education had an ounce of integrity, they would have been working diligently on the problem of getting children over that hump because there's a hump in reading comprehension, eh? Because to begin with, like there is when you're learning how to play music. You have to automate 
letter recognition and syllable recognition and word recognition and then phrase recognition. So you get a phrase in a gl at a glance. As soon as you've got that, you can start to read for meaning. It's no longer effortful. And then as soon as you can read for meaning, of course, it's, it's just as engaging as watching a movie, which people obviously don't have to be taught to do. And so there are all these problems that are laying out there in the world and, and people have a set of problems that bug them that they could be working on fixing and they have all this technology to fix it. It's like, that's, that's what you want to do is figure out what you, what you think needs to be fixed and then take all this wealth that you had put at your disposal and fix it, man. And then you got something to do with your life and you don't have to hang your head in shame because you're ruining everything. Quite the contrary. That's actually wrong. It also is counterproductive in relationship to the stated goals of the people producing the anxiety. Because what happens to men who are demoralized, young men who are demoralized, is that because they lose hope and then don't put in effort and become cynical, that they, their relationships get fractured and they have no productive activity. And so their lives get more and more difficult and, 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 cynicism inducing as they withdraw into this sort of nihilistic negative buddhism in some sense and then they get bitter and then they get resentful and then they get angry and then look the hell out and so be because if you push people into a corner by demoralizing them about like the very nature of their existence itself or about existence itself it isn't that they're just going to wander away quietly and disappear into the woodwork like like mice some of them will do that but others will turn into unbelievable monsters and we always throw up our hands and wave around when we see something happen like happened in buffalo it's like well why did that happen it's like well if you wanted to know, you could know, but you don't want to know. That's what the utopian egalitarians don't get. They're not doing students any favor by making them revel in their victimhood because it also strikes at the knee of what gives young people a meaning and drive in their life in the first place. You can't turn people into a victim without making them resentful of the fact itself. And that's always the first step toward a demographic that has turned on the very system that sustains them. Isn't that exactly what you see today? You see America's university students as one of the most privileged groups of people in the world, fixated on tearing down the patriarchy, capitalism, and institutional racism, and in that sheer ingratitude, they're undoing the greatest gifts that their ancestors have worked and toiled to give them. Someone like Jordan Peterson understands just how sad of a reflection that is on where our education is headed, and perhaps heeding his warning is the first step toward course correction.